my name is Urvashi Devidayal and I lead uh, the Sankalp Forum for the Avishkar Group. Um, I, I specifically lead the Sankalp Global Summit. I have a colleague out here, Ariel Molino, who's based in Nairobi and she leads the Sankalp Africa Summit. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I, I see a lot of friends and uh, a, a lot of people who've attended the summit over the years. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Sankalp is an initiative that was started by IntelliCap in 2009. And uh, the entire sort of ethos behind it is to create a enabling uh, ecosystem to support entrepreneurs, uh, to support the entire ecosystem of investors, philanthropists, government, private sector to come together uh, to solve the SDGs. So thank you all for attending this webinar. We are incredibly pleased to partner with uh, the Catalyst Fund, which is powered by BFA Global. And um, we have uh, Rasima Swaroop and Michelle Hassan based in Nairobi. Rasima's in Delhi, who is going to be leading this conversation this evening. And Michelle is based in Nairobi. And we're really pleased to partner with them on this conversation. So I'm gonna let Rasima take over from here and introduce the subject, the topic of today. Thank you. Thank you, Urvashi, for kicking us off and for the opportunity to be part of your series. And also thank you all for being here. We're, we're very excited to have you. Um, as Urvashi mentioned, my name is Rasima Swaroop and I'm the country manager for BFA Global and Cat Catalyst Fund in India. For those who don't know, BFA Global is a research, product innovation and strategy consulting firm leveraging data, technology and finance to improve the lives of vulnerable and underserved communities around the world. And Catalyst Fund is our flagship inclusive tech accelerator supporting startups to build more affordable, accessible, and appropriate solutions for underserved communities and developing innovation ecosystems in emerging markets. I am also, like Urvashi mentioned, joined by my colleague and country manager for Kenya, Michelle. And we're excited to discuss emerging fintech opportunities for underserved digital gig workers in India and Kenya. At Catalyst Fund, this area is a core investment thesis for us, and we've recently published a report on digital platforms for the gig economy and how fintech can play a role in improving the financial health of workers, which you can also access through our website. But for today, India and Kenya are both mature markets for fintech. They're paving the way for a new generation of fintech solutions that can be embedded across digital platforms to reach new underserved segments such as gig workers. Initial evidence suggests that while these workers have some level of regular employment, their incomes are inconsistent and they have little control over wages, they lack access to regular controls and benefits of formal employment, and blue collar gig workers are especially vulnerable to poor work conditions which together raise concerns about their financial health. So today we want to further learn from the experts in the room on how innovators and investors across the two markets support inclusive solutions for this growing segment. I'd like to introduce our panelists, if we could go to the next slide. Um, and we first have Rishi Razban from Acumen India. Rishi is the sector lead for workforce development and livelihoods here, uh, which is an area that Acumen has been building on over the last decade. They recently also invested in Hakdarshak, a tech platform supporting underserved segments like construction workers to avail government benefits. We also have Badal Malik, the co-founder for Karma Life, an Indian startup developing financial resilience products for blue collar gig workers starting out with flexible credit options and instant payments. Karma Life also recently joined the Catalyst Fund family. From Kenya, we have Gituku Ngene from Youth Impact Labs, which is a Google.org funded program at Mercy Corps that identifies and tests innovative tech-enabled solutions to tackle global youth unemployment Gituku is the post investment and learning advisor here and oversees cutting edge research with a particular focus on the future of work, tech innovation, financial inclusion, and the digital economy. Last but not least, we also have Shakib Msubuga, the innovation and operations manager at Safe Boda, 
a local motorbike ride hailing company where Shakib leads driver wellness initiatives. Uh, Safeboda is headquartered in Nigeria and has a presence in Kenya as well as in Uganda, which is where Shakib is based. Um, they also partner with fintech companies like Chiraco uh, to offer customized insurance products for their drivers as part of the wellness initiatives. Um, before we get started, two things. I'd love to set some ground rules. The panel discussion will go for about 40, 45 minutes. And we have the remaining time for Q&A at the end, which Michelle will lead. Um, you can also post questions in the chat or raise your hand, uh, which you can find through the participants button on the Zoom screen at the bottom. And uh, Michelle can help coordinate these questions during the discussion as well. Um, the format for the panel is where members will stick to basically two minute responses. So it's a bit like a rapid fire conversation. Um, and just before we start the panel, we'd love to know who's in the room. And so there's a poll that will appear in front of you just for us to understand which entity you represent. So I'll give you just a few seconds uh, for, for us to be able to assess that. I'll just give it a few more seconds. All right. Do we? Great. So it looks like we have a pretty broad range of folks in the room at the moment, ranging from startups to financial service providers, researchers, as well as other accelerator programs. So that's super exciting. And I hope that the, this will lead to a more engaging set of Q&A towards the end as well. Um, we have one more question for you at this stage, which is, do you believe that the gig economy is the next big opportunity for startups? This is just a feeler in terms of understanding the lay of the land in terms of who's, of how you feel about the topic at the moment. A few more seconds. All right, so we see a majority of us saying that we are still learning about this area, which is great because you're in the right place um, as we delve into talking uh, about this topic with some of the experts and practitioners here in the room. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this poll and let's get started then. Um, so we know that Kenya and India are both seeing a rapid growth in the digital gig workers. Uh, the, the, gig, the digital gig economy is expected to grow by 17 and 33 percent in India and Kenya by 2023, which creates a pretty sizable group of young semi-employed people with particular financial needs. So perhaps we could start with a little bit about the opportunity and to, to Rishi and to Gituku, based on your research and your experience in this space, what are some of the needs that fintech innovators can address in your respective markets? Uh, perhaps we could start with Gituku. Sure. Um, thanks, Trasima. So um, 
thank you so much. Um, we at Masico have been doing, you know, um, quite some um, research on this space. Um, we did a study on the Kenya gig economy sometime last year, and more recently, we just concluded one on um, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. And um, what we've seen is a, is a, is a space that's evolving uh, very rapidly. Um, and, you know, that's characterized by a lot of innovation and forward thinking, particularly in Kenya, which is a much more liberal and innovative ecosystem. Um, the, 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 the thing is, as, you know, as this pace grows, um, there is need for us to think uh, specifically about the workers, um, which has been something that has been, you know, at the core of our focus. Um, you know, as we think about the jobs created on online platforms and the quality and decency of those jobs. So, you know, um, one thing that comes to the fore is, um, you know, the social welfare of these workers um, and thinking about how uh, well they're, you know, blanketed from um, the shocks um, around them. And, you know, COVID-19 has really flagged that as a big issue. When you start to think about, you know, um, things like, you know, work insurance, health insurance, um, you know, um, other financial products such as uh, savings um, and, you know, lending, um, which, you know, contribute to the overall welfare of the workers. And so as much as we see um, the digital economy um, as an opportunity to transition, you know, a large section of the unemployed in Kenya, East Africa and countries like India, we really need to think about about how does financial inclusion come in as a complement to really enhance the quality and decency of these jobs. Um, and so um, we really, you know, at our, in the course of our work and in our interactions with partners, we're really pushing for a lot of innovation around um, this, um, you know, financial space while taking into account that, you know, the, the gig economy is significantly different from, you know, other types of employment. And so financial players, uh, particularly financial, um, you know, um, institutions, regulators, and other players need to be a bit more innovative rather than, you know, taking a cut and paste approach of um, existing products and, you know, offering them to gig workers. So that element of, you know, really pushing the envelope um, in terms of asking what the needs of these gig workers are is something that um, needs to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that from your, from your study as well, you're seeing that there are gaps in really just understanding the needs of the gig workers? That's right. Yeah. There's, right. there's, there's quite, sorry. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are gaps um, in the sense that whatever is being provided in the market right now is very, um, you know, is, is not tailored for um, the gig market. And so um, I'll take an example of, you know, loan products, for instance, um, when you think about um, how gig workers, you know, get engagements, um, you know, they're not as regular as, um, you know, a salaried or a full-time employee. And so um, when financial institutions, for, for, for example, you know, think about how to, to structure these products for gig workers, then um, we are seeing, you know, um, a fair level of, you know, an information gap on their part um, with regard to really understanding how do we um, understand, you know, for example, the financial flows of a gig worker, um, you know, their characteristics, their habits, their ability to pay, um, etc. And I think that information gap um, is something that needs to be filled, um, you know, over, over time and as rapidly as possible. And also on the part um, of these financial service providers and intermediaries, also, you know, investing in some time to really understand the dynamics of this market and then use that, um, you know, use that intelligence to then um, iterate and optimize the products that they're bringing to the market. But as far as what we're seeing right now, I think there's still um, quite a big gap in terms of what the market needs and what um, financial providers are offering. Right, super, super interesting. 
And I guess this similar, the same question to Rishi, uh, what, what are your thoughts about India and where, where do you see uh, fintech innovators helping? Where do you see the gaps? Yeah, no, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I think it's interesting to place how we think of gig workers first, because, you know, between 85 and 90% of the Indian workforce is informal. Uh, so gig economy workers are actually uh, a fairly small part of that. If you take the whole, a small but significant part of that. What's interesting about them is they're actually the most cash rich of informal workers in that entire space, right? So they're compared to smallholder farmers or uh, daily, wa uh, daily wage laborers or construction workers. Uh, the reason that financialization is really even possible with gig economy workers is because uh, they're some of the most cash rich in the context of these other ones. So of course, there's one whole suite of uh, sort of security products, which is whether it's micro insurance or it's credit or it's even savings products, you know, uh, where for, with, with the spare change that people might have at any given point in time, can you build a, a reasonable savings product for such people? Uh, I think the other really interesting question to me really is what do we do about their aspirations? Because I think it's very clear in large parts of the West that if somebody's in a gig economy job, that's something they're passing through. Uh, in India, we haven't really thought it through in the same way. Uh, so can we look at things like education financing and skill financing for gig workers? Can we help uh, them set a learning path and an aspirational path while they're in these jobs? Because one of the key sort of issues that you come across in skilling and education is that you can't actually have good products because the vast majority of people can pay nothing for those skilling and education services. So if it's not government provided or philanthropy given, people just there. So is it possible to sort of link up with skills in education and provide, uh, you know, upskilling to people who are in the gig economy uh, section of the workforce? Because these are people who still have some amount of ability to repay. Uh, I think that's uh, that's that's a space that I think is particularly interesting uh, because in India, given just you know our our socioeconomic situation, uh, caste equations, social mobility is very very poor. And uh, I think the gig economy is an interesting avenue to challenge that problem of social mobility. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, so, that's uh, yeah. right. And and so Rishi, your your thesis at Acumen Fund, at least within the sector of workforce development and livelihoods, um, it has been around skills development, and and I wonder how. How are you approaching the support to digital gig workers? Is it primarily what you just said? How do we link these, uh, their aspirations to uh, potential upskilling in such a way that they could grow better? Are there any other uh, areas yeah. in, in how you're thinking about the thesis? Uh, yeah, so the, again, that's a great question. I think we, uh, we look at the space through three lenses. Uh, the three lenses being uh, skill building, uh, social mobility, and social security. I think that's at the end of it what gives uh, what gives reasonable employment, decent employment to people. So, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of our thesis was initially focused on skill building, uh, and then we realized that a vast section of jobs in India actually don't depend on skills; they depend on job readiness, which is fundamentally a different thing from skills. Uh, to have a skill is to say that I can code or I can do financial modeling. To be job ready is to know that, you know, okay, this is how I, I speak to a customer who comes into my store or uh, this is how I set up this app that on which I accept payment. So it's not really skill building. It's more to do with getting ready for the job that you're going to do. So that's one aspect of it. The second mm -hmm. aspect of it is social mobility. Can, can we help you go farther than traditional uh, social ties allow you to go? And uh, finally, it's social security. And I think uh, we look at the gay economy uh, through, through sort of the same lens, right? Uh, can we help a lot of the people who are in this space build more significant skill rather than just be job ready? Can we help them uh, uh, access? I mean, actually, in so many ways, you've seen the gay economy is a way to find some social mobility because there are, uh, you know, not that many barriers to entry. Anybody can do that job, which is why you'll often... Uh, you, you'll often see people from communities that don't traditionally get employed in mainstream roles get opportunities in the gig economy space, which I think is a particularly interesting part about this space. And finally, social security, which is what a lot of these uh, financial technology products 
or even for example hamdarshak which you mentioned address right which uh, it's really focused on uh, bringing you a sense of social security through giving you access to government benefits mm-hmm. uh, fascinating that's that's super interesting um especially when we think about how how the uh it, the environment in kenya is at the moment and we're thinking about really understanding the lives understanding the the dynamics and similarly in in india doing so but really focusing on um more of the skills building the social mobility looking at the aspirational part of it too um switching to the innovators by the karma life what inspired you to focus on this particular segment and what particular needs were you seeing there sure um so i i think just uh, i mean rishi said Uh, you know a really good stage i think it's very important to understand and situate the the gig workers or what we you know kind of uh, you know what we define as maybe digital gig workers against the backdrop of the larger you know uh, massive uh, informal segment informal worker segment which uh, remains vulnerable and deeply underserved um, i mean gig workers are the fastest growing employment segment in india today right um and and they are kind of like i would say the, the the will become the burgeoning new emerging middle class or lower middle class right so uh, and i agree that they are cash generating um, you know they spend a lot on on goods and services in the economy even non digital gig workers are cash gener- generating for that matter right it's just that we don't really have uh, i mean you know that's a difference between the organized sector and the unorganized sector because in the organized sector you actually see that cash in the un- unorganized sector it's all ether space right so um i think i think the one for us the key differentiating factor is risk right risk for these populations is real time and it's hard to capture uh, which is why there is this huge finance gap uh, since traditional financial institutions and business models are unable to serve them and at the end of the day this for us becomes a dynamic data problem which we are keen to solve right so 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 from this massive underserved segment starting with digital gig workers in particular was appealing because these guys are relatively organized they can be accessed through channels such as aggregator platforms uh, and they have rich digital footprints in terms of the work data through the platforms they affiliate with but as as well as from their own smartphone use and online transactions um so 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 that kind of was for us uh, what excited us about uh, starting here um mm-hmm. i mean i i think it is also uh, very important to understand the broader needs right these are young aspirational extremely hard working workers um you know uh, you have to i mean we are focused on a range of financial services uh you know uh, which allows them to smooth and smooth and cash flows invest in the future protect against you know specific risks that they are exposed to build wealth to achieve personal and family goals uh, and and particularly especially given their age profiles invest in old age security because when they grow up uh, you know when they when they when they you know Uh, become when they retire india will be in a very different uh, situation than it is today um but i think in addition to just the finance part i think it's important and we you know keep that uh, acute focus as well on the broader uh, needs you know in terms of favorable access to goods and services i mean they get paid a certain amount it's pretty you know the heuristics are pretty clear i mean there's a certain amount they get paid it's a hand to mouth existence it's rent you know they spend on rent affordable housing groceries fuel vehicle uh, maintenance electronics you know remittances healthcare education right uh, and and uh, in a in an urban kind of environment they want access easy seamless favorable uh, you know uh, affordable access to these services a uh, career progression as i think rishi had mentioned um, i think i think a lot of them see their current work as a means to an end uh, what are the break points what are the information i mean do they get information and resources for career pro- progression See, it's not just about upskilling parts it's also about helping them plot their careers right mm-hmm. um uh it's uh, the other part is you know social and workplace protections which go beyond finance right leave without pay minimum wage social security i mean flexibility is good but with that you know covid has been a a, a, a you know a, a clear eye opener but but security some measure of security is also important uh yeah so absolutely that's kind of how we see it mm mm-hmm. makes and it makes a lot of sense it sounds very wholesome i guess uh, trying to fit every piece of the puzzle to to make that livelihood better for for the gig workers um and and so very interesting point i'd love to shift to the east african region um shakib from what you've heard from all three of our other panel members um 
we'd love to understand two things from you. The first being, uh, are you seeing similar patterns as what Badal mentioned with the driver workforce that you work with? Um, and then, and then really, how similar or different are the needs as as you've seen from from your work? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So, um, def definitely, definitely, there's a lot of uh, similarity in patterns in terms of uh, description of uh, uh, gig workers. Uh, say border borders, just to give you uh, an understanding. Border uh, in Uganda we, we, or in East Africa, border borders are the motorcycle taxis, and uh, safe border. Uh, started operations uh, about five years ago in Uganda to sort of uh, figure out how to uh, legitimize and you know uh, provide some structure in in in, in a really unstructured industry. Um, border border uh, uh, as an employment uh, opportunity is the second largest employment employer of Ugandans, or in, uh, in especially in Kampala. So it was a very easy way for place for people to go to find uh, you know. Uh, uh, get to, to find work and gig workers characteristically uh, as mentioned uh, you know they live hand to mouth so there's very little um, long-term uh, planning in terms of financial planning uh, there's limited access to capital because uh, you, like you said we don't have we're not able to 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 uh, to we're not able to have records of how they're how they're earning and how they're spending uh, they are they're, they are also the primary earners in their families so they are the people that are if they are affected, if they are not able to work, uh, they have an, an entire family that is dependent upon that that that, that they depend on. That's dependent upon their, their success. So it's important for them to continuously have work. So in case they get an accident, or in case they are not, they, they get COVID, they are not able to work. Or for example, what happened in Uganda? Uh, the president stopped um, um, passenger transport for over five years. So we had, we had so we've had five five over five months. So we've had five months of no earning. So they've had to look for alternative sources of income. So if they're not in a position to, uh, to, to save uh, for a rainy day, if there's no um, financial um, sort of source for them to, to help them go through uh, these tough times, it becomes incredibly hard. So um, the way we look at you know, wellness for drivers, uh, we look at it not just in a financial, from a financial st standpoint, but also from a uh, uh, so a social uh, standpoint, and also maybe like a, we look at their their mental health and and, and, and stuff like that. So um, we we have seen that um, if gig workers do not have uh, you know even their social standing because of the lack of uh, uh, security, they they are not seen. They're, it's not seen as a lucrative um, business opportunity and, until you go into it. Uh, but we know very well, speaking for Uganda, you know a teacher. That has, that has taught for five years earns a lot less money than a, someone who is on a border border. So they're actually uh, big opportunities, but they, are not, they have not been placed or structured in a way to, to show everyone else uh, the benefit. Mm -hmm. That's extremely interesting because it actually comes back to what Rishi was also talking about in terms of the three areas, which is, which there's definitely the aspiration, the aspiration to grow, um, but there is, you know, the social mobility aspect and the social security aspect in addition to the aspirations to grow. Um, mm. and, and what's interesting is also, yes, the, the way that, uh, what, what Gitupu was mentioning, that ultimately there are still a lot of gaps which companies like SafeBoda are able to, to capture better, at least for their workforce. And, and it would be un brilliant to understand how best we could even collaborate moving forward. Um, but Super interesting and coming to perhaps the design in terms of how we tend to design these products. So at Catalyst Fund, we, we do talk about making products triple A, which is uh, accessible, affordable, and appropriate for the target segment to ensure that they are really designed to work for those segments. But we also know that it's extremely difficult. Um, we've understood just just now that there are a lot of different complexities that we're working with across the two markets. Some are similar, some are slightly different. Um, I guess to start with you, Badal, um, you started out with offering credit and payment solutions to the gig workers. And I wonder why this particular choice of product first, especially you know, given what we're hearing from Rishi as well, the skills building side, what we're hearing from uh, 
Shakib as well in, in terms of the non-financial side. So why, why exactly this product first? Sure. So, so we obviously, you know, we're coming at it from a finance, from, from kind of plugging that, that, that gap or hole in, in, in financial services. But we've innovated on top of the UPI stack in India to transform what essentially is a debit product into a credit product, right? So we have rolled out a flexible line of credit uh, with a configurable, it's a configurable limit that we peg to predicted earnings and a configurable repayment cycle that we link to platform payouts, right? And this helps the users smoothen their week on week or month on month cash flows, safeguard against sudden small emergencies um, and not have to ultimately routinely borrow from friends and family. Right. Uh, so credit, we all know, is a pull product in India and just seemed like a great place to start. But we also want to ensure responsible use of credit, which is a way to ensure long term sustainable credit. Right. Uh, and, and so the payments intermediation aspect is critical. Uh, so we know, you know, uh, that that these workers spend, you know, and that can be different kinds of spending, it could be household spending, it could be working capital spending. So, for example, if, if, if you're a cab driver, you know, spending on fuel or, or an electrician spending on tools, we know that it is enhancing your business. If you're, you know, uh, uh, if you're a, a, a delivery worker who is, you know, uh, spending on household, uh, you know, aspects that I mentioned before, then it's enhancing welfare. Uh, so by being able to intermediate the payments, we're able to see what they're spending on, we're able to promote, uh, you know, responsible use of credit, and ultimately it also helps us underwrite them, you know, further in the future. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I guess comparing and contrasting, Shakib, back to you, just a very quick question here. Within your driver wellness program, you mentioned there is you know, financial and non-financial areas. What did you actually start off with to offer and support your drivers as? Was it also credit options or was it something else? So uh, I think uh, we start by meeting the drivers where they are, where they're interested in. Uh, because, you know, sometimes you can develop a solution and the uptake of the solution is not aligned with uh, how these guys see where the, the problems are. So um, we started off, uh, we, we know that the biggest motivation for, uh, for, for people is finance and money. So we started off by um, doing like a, a needs assessment to understand the different needs uh, of drivers. And we basically, we looked at, um, we asked them different questions about their expenditure, how many of them have loans. Uh, how many of them, how many people are in their families, what do they see as their challenges? And a lot of, a lot of their challenges were around collecting uh, money and having a, 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 enough money to achieve, uh, to, to have, uh, achieve long and short-term goals. So we started off by having a financial literacy training course uh, by, that sort of uh, talk, talks about all the different facets of financial literacy, from goal setting to um, saving to handling, how do you handle loans positively to the power of insurance. Then uh, we introduced our savings uh, accounts where we orient our drivers towards short-term goals and encourage positive uh, behavior like that. And then our drivers also given, um, you know, loan management um, training because every single driver that joins uh, uh, the, the, the fleet is offered a, mo a mobile phone on loan if you don't have one. So you have to pay back uh, that mobile phone uh, uh, periodically every week, so you're able to understand how to separate uh, the money that come, you know, your, your money for your daily expenses to money to pay back uh, mobile phones. Then we also offer uh, asset financing uh, with uh, third party, uh, with, with different third parties. Uh, like we work with a company called What to Credit that offer bike financing. We're also working to see if we can offer phone financing outside of ourselves. And then uh, additionally, we also offer a third party driver payments uh, gateway that sort of uh, provides uh, drivers with access to products that they would not have gotten otherwise, like, uh, like cooking gas, uh, like solar. And we also work on a pilot to see if uh, we can offer a school fees payment uh, that sort of allows, that alle alleviates the pressure of having to come up with a lot of money uh, because uh, if, you know, and also, off also off off provides a really good a lucrative uh, space for third party companies to come and you know offer do, do this business then in, mm -hmm. in addition to this we also looked at their social needs and uh, we came up we realized a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, our border border drivers in general have a lot of uh, gender based violence um, associated uh, issues so we have been working with uh, uh, UNFPA 
uh, to develop, uh, you know, s sort of sensitization um, materials and inclusivity materials and uh, proper campaigns and ambassadors to sort of improve uh, how border borders and safe borders view issues surrounding gender-based violence. And we also have health camps uh, that sort of bring together uh, different um, health service providers to offer um, health information and also just improve access to health. Um, in different uh, areas, including mental health, uh, including sexual reproductive health, and all these other interesting spaces. So um, we, right, we start from uh, where the, the driver is, and then sort of introduce them to newer things. It's easier that way. That's extremely, it. extremely interesting, uh, especially the approach that you took, which was really understanding the driver's needs first, um, understanding that they needed some uh, literacy, some courses, basically, to, to help them manage their finances better and, and continue to elaborate on that. Extremely fascinating. I think um, I'd, I'd love to ask, you know, Gituku Rishi, from what you're hearing about the way that the, the two companies have been approaching their solutions and approaching the design, um, what are your thoughts about uh, where they should probably focus on or any reactions based on your experience uh, in the space? Perhaps, you know, we could, we could start with um, Gituku maybe. Yep, thanks Rasima. So, so I think um, great, great work from Badal um, and Shakib um, in India and Uganda and I think, I think as, as we think about um, this, and I think, you know, you, I, I, I think it sounds like, you know, you have the fundamentals of, you know, what's needed. Um, but more and more as we engage with uh, workers, what we find is, um, and I think there's been, um, you know, a couple of points there alluding to the aspirational nature of these workers. Um, and so even, you know, as platform think, as platforms think about um, engaging workers and you know collaborating with other workers um, to support them, um, it, it it will be critical um, and you know uh, very important uh, for platforms to think about how do we how do we grow uh, workers within our platforms? How do we see um, you know the workers moving from you know one point at the point where they entered? Uh, you know, to and, and have very clear growth pathways for them um, in terms of how they grow. And uh, from, from some of our work with, you know, um, platforms in Kenya, what we've seen is, um, so with one of our partners uh, that, you know, supports um, or rather that works with um, furniture makers, uh, what they focused on is, you know, like an internal, um, you know, uh, academy that allows um, these workers to train in-house and then grow themselves and then at some point um, due to the uh, level of demand the platform has created they then sort of release them into you know sort of um, you know uh, subcontractors for the platform and also support them to you know like develop workshops uh, help them with you know um, establishing premises uh, getting you know uh, the right tools for the job and then uh, support them in ensuring um, you know the pipeline of work um, is still maintained yeah um, and and so with that kind of a uh, pathway to growth for the worker then we do see you know much more significant value than an arrangement where a platform only allows for you know that interaction of um, there's a gig on one side let's connect you to this gig. Um, and, you know, that cycle continues over time without, you know, um, significant, you know, growth on the part of, of the worker. So, so if platforms can sort of, um, you know, uh, relook into their business models and see how they can integrate that component, I think that will be, um, you know, really critical as you think about the growth. The other thing is uh, partnerships, and, and I know we might touch about that uh, later, but also thinking about um, how do we um, onboard and support potential partners to really understand our business model 
um, and the and the dynamics of the industry in which we play with. Because most times when we bring, you know, when platforms bring on board uh, financial institutions, there's a very steep learning curve for these partners um, that uh, platforms at times will take for granted. But um, when you take it upon yourself um, and as the responsibility of the platform to really and hold these you know, partners, um, and I'm just using financial institutions in, as an example, then the value that you derive from these partnerships then become much more than you know, where you assume that you know, these guys know their stuff and so they're gonna bring um, their expertise um, you know, on the table. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I do see that, that element of really taking it upon yourself to you know, sort of walk your partners through your space and help them understand it better is something that you know really um, catalyzes the value that you get. It's extremely interesting uh, as an approach as well. And I, yeah, I, I agree. I think um, looking at partnerships uh, in that lens would be super helpful. I guess, Rishi, from your experience delving in the space, anything you would add to Karma Life's approach, Safe Photos approach uh, to what Gituku just said? Yeah, I, I feel I'm uh, better suited to uh, give any advice to Karma Life than I am uh, to people uh, who might not be in India because I think India is quite a, a unique and very large informal market. Uh, I mean, I would I would definitely say that you know adjacencies are at hand in terms of your target beneficiaries. Uh, you know, I, I, I there is, there is just the kind of mobilization that happens uh, of the informal workforce in India is just it's incredible, right? And so many of those people have similar problems, if not the same, right? Micro insurance, uh, uh, you know, uh, sending money back home. Uh, so like, I, I think literally uh, over 80% of the construction industry uh, works with migrants who are always working to send money back home. And it's permanently a problem. And this still happens, there's massive leakage. This happens to middlemen, et cetera. So, so I would just be, uh, I would just advise, uh, you know, anyone working on this problem, working on the gig economy in India, to think of adjacencies, uh, because there are so many, and I think uh, this would require slight design modifications, because gig workers, by definition, are more tech savvy than, say, construction workers. It requires a, a several more, a great, much greater emphasis on maybe instructions in audio, video. Uh, greater use of vernacular, greater use, I mean, uh, you know, in, in terms of bandwidth, you're looking at phones, maybe even uh, one level lower than the ones that gig workers use in terms of bandwidth usage, all of it, right? So I think those are things to uh, be kept in mind because uh, that's how, I think that's how a mass market solution can be developed in this space, in this mm -hmm. particular space. Right. And and I guess one one other question for you on adjacencies, and we're, we're going to this will probably be one of the last few questions within partnerships, I guess, uh, as we segue into partnerships. It's for, for, for these kinds of startups, what kind of partnerships do you think are ideal partnerships as you would explore adjacencies or um, actually develop or explore more designs uh, for, for the gig workers? No, so that's a... Sorry, uh, I think I lost you for a second there. Uh, sorry. So, I, I, yeah, I, I think there's a, I mean, obviously the, the, the platforms are a great uh, sort of uh, uh, avenue to, to, to get a greater user base. Uh, but there, there are also like more non-traditional partnerships that can be of help. Uh, you know, there's a large number of non-profits that work with the informal workforce that do some great work with it. So you've got Jan Sahas, et cetera, in India that are doing some really great work uh, with, with informal workers across the country, uh, which can be an interesting source of data, uh, an interesting source of direction. Uh, you know, uh, another, uh, I mean, another thing I think, which is going to be, uh, I think in India, this is not quite as successful. I, actually, even in the West, I don't think it's, it's quite reached the level of majority is, is work shifting, right? Work shifter apps are, uh, for, a, for a hot moment, they were supposed to be the rage, but they didn't quite succeed in the way that they were supposed to. But it, it just seems like a matter of time before they do uh, because without that, it, the utilization is just 
not there for the gig worker. Uh, so, so that's something that's bound to happen. So any emerging solutions around work shifting are going to be uh, incredibly important in this space. Mm -hmm. Right. That's super interesting. Again, I think on, on the partnerships front, we know that uh, both for for Karma Life and for Safe Boda, there you have looked at a lot of different kinds of partnerships. Um, with with Karma Life, it has been very much with various gig platforms of the likes of Uber and Zomato, at least to start with. Um, and with Safe Boda, like you said, there were a lot of different partnerships that you're already looking at. Um, to offer various kinds of either courses or um, other products. So I, I am conscious of the time. Unfortunately, what I will do, because I would love to open some, have some questions from the audience, is perhaps at this point just ask you for one final question, which is just like a, a bit of a close. And, and that's on, you know, if you were to tweet one action that you would probably do as a result of what you learned from this panel or a piece of advice from what you've learned, a light bulb moment, um, what would that be? And I could perhaps start with the innovators uh, from, say, from Badal, given that we just heard from Rishi, and perhaps then go to Shakib. Unmute, Badal. Yeah, no, I... Yeah. Somebody unmuted me, I didn't realize. Um, no, I, I think, uh, I mean, and this is still abstract in my mind, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think um, the need to focus on the narrow but enable kind of a broad view, whether it be in terms of needs, uh, partnerships, etc., is, I think, an important, uh, you know, a bit to start, sort of chew on. Um, uh, and think adjacencies. I mean, we've been very narrow because we've, you know, we're, we're relatively new. And I also think there is, you know, you have to, as a startup, uh, you know, uh, uh, just to survive, you need to kind of think, you know, be narrow and uh, win narrow and then kind of broaden. But uh, I think, uh, I think you can't lose back or you can't lose sight of the, of the broader picture. And there are all sorts of small, you know, design partnership and other type of decisions that that uh, come up, uh, so I think I think that's that's probably you know a theme that I'm taking from this. Great, uh, Shakib. Yeah, so for me, I think uh, something that I've just been making note of. I have a note of here something about reactionary versus uh, proactivity in terms of coming up with the, the different partnerships. I think uh, it's something that we. we you know, the gig economy is, is, is new in terms of legitimizing it and there's a lot of learning that we have to do. So I think it's about really keeping an open mind and just understanding that uh, there's so much, like the, the, the entire ecosystem needs to be taken uh, into consideration before um, making, uh, you know, developing solutions. Uh, because, you know, you can develop solutions and they sp you spend a lot of time developing and then the utilization of them is, is low. So having that consideration of, Reactivity and proactivity, I think, uh, is a delicate balance to take into consideration. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, Gituku, would you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I think what's, what's striking is the similarity across both markets, uh, Kenya and India. Um, I think, you know, with regard to, you know, the maturity of the market, um, the needs of the workers, um, at least, you know, drawing from Rishi and Badal's uh, points, I do see, you know, um, a lot of mirroring of what we're seeing in Kenya. And, you know, when we think about, um, you know, just just picking up, you know, uh, base around, you know, um, the three um, areas that Rishi mentioned, you know, skill building, social security, social mobility. I think, you know, when you think about gig work um, in Kenya, and I think by extension, Uganda, you know, it's the same uh, challenges that we are trying to address. And so I do see a very interesting opportunity from, for cross learnings between, um, you know, um, players across both countries um, where we can really draw on, you know, what's being done in either of the markets um, and, you know, use those lessons to advance what we're doing within our uh, respective ecosystems. That makes a lot of sense. And that is why this panel. 
Um, Rishi, would you would you want to take the final word? You know, first of all, I would like to say that none of the panelists tweeted. They all gave uh, relatively. So I, I'm just putting that in perspective. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I, I would like if I would, you know, brevity is the soul of wit. So I'm going to try and be brief. Uh, I'd say, you know, we have to design multifunctionally. Um, and, and, and think of the adjacencies. That's it. That's great. Um, thank you so much, by the way, panel, panel members, all of you for your time today. I personally feel there's quite a lot to learn. Um, I, will, I will pass this on at the moment and bring Michelle on board to help wrap up and field any questions for the panel members in the last few minutes. Um, Michelle? Great, thank you, Rasima, and thank you so much to the panel. I think it is really interesting to see how the two countries are so far apart in distance, but very similar uh, with kind of the challenges we're seeing with the gig economy. So I'll not even do the summary until the end. Um, we could probably just open up for question. I can see Alim on the chat asking Rishi, this is to you, what is work shifting? That uh, so work shifting is just, it's a type of app that, uh, that works with multiple aggregators and multi, multiple gig economy players to give, uh, to utilize the time of the gig worker better. So for example, if you, if you sort of register onto the work shifting app, then you could work for Uber in the first half and you could work for Zomato in the second half, uh, depending on who has how much work. So in that way you end up working more hours and making more money. Oh, great. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we've seen that a lot as well in Kenya, even like with the logistics company, people having about two or three more apps. Anyone else who has a question? And as you guys are thinking, um, I actually have one for Gitoku. Um, and based, how do we move it uh, from our actually increasing it from not just being urban based and moving more to the rural area, considering most of the countries in the rural area? Sure. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question, Michelle, because um, I think as much as uh, the gig economy has grown in Kenya, we continue to see that growing divide between, you know, urban centers and the more, you know, rural and marginalized spaces. And I think um, there are a couple of things that, that are driving this that you know, um, innovators need to address for. So one is um, an infrastructural question um, where you know, rural um, areas has, have been historically you know, behind um, in terms of you know, the, the infrastructure that's available for them. And this is you know, whether it's internet, um, access to devices, um, you know, generally you know, with, with regard to the digital element, um, of gig work. And so as, as, as innovators think about entering into these spaces, then I think it will be critical for, for them to sort of think about how do we innovate for uh, the level of infrastructure that's there. So say, you know, smartphone penetration in urban cities um, is much more higher versus, you know, rural areas where they still have feature phones. So if you're, if you're building out a technology, um, consider you know, doing something like a USSD version um, of that innovation that seeks to reach out to you know, the much more rural folk. So that's, that's, that's one example um, when you think about infrastructure. Another one will be partnerships with you know, um, folks who could sort of push um, that infrastructure gap um, or rather narrow, narrow it um, within these spaces, whether it's, you know, mobile, mobile companies, um, you know, um, non, you know, non-profit actors um, who, who sort of have that leverage um, to invest, invest in that kind of resource. Um, the, other, the, other, the other thing that's a big consideration when it comes to the rural urban divide is, is a skills question. Um, where you find uh, the level of skills, um, you know, uh, within, uh, you know, and I'll refer to young people because we've seen this as a significant subset um, in the digital economy, 
um, the skill levels in rural areas are, are significantly lower. And so thinking about how you can rapidly um, scale up these young people, um, and by scaling, we're not talking about the formal system. It's, you know, like enabling them to understand, you know, very basic things around, you know, fulfillment, um, you know, the use of digital platforms, et cetera. Um, how can you rapidly upskill them and as a result, include them into the gig um, economy? And there's been, you know, quite some interesting models used by uh, different um, partners, you know, there are lessons that can also be borrowed from other industries that have sort of penetrated, um, you know, some of these regions, you know, like, you know, folks in the e-commerce space um, and sort of trying to see how we can adapt those for the gig economy. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I think those are the two points from my side. Thank you so much, Ujibu. Um, I can see a country on the chat um, for battle and shrinking. Um, have you ever thought of applying a gender lens to your product? Maybe, but. Well, I, um, I think uh, I can read the question, but your voice, uh, Michelle, I think is I mean, the, the connection, connectivity issues. So uh, did I hear that correctly? Was that question for me? Uh, I think that question was for you. Yeah, that. for the gender. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's for you for the gender lens. Okay. Um, have you ever thought about, about applying a gender lens to your product? Yes, sure. And I see another question, which is what, what are the most common uses for the credit lines and savings enabled for gig economy? Um, so, so, so gender lens, yes, we would love to be in a state where we can, or, you know, love to be in a situation where we can say that we have female customers. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a, it's, it has more to do with the, the, the segment and the, and the sector. Uh, gig, digital gig in India is overridingly male. Uh, and I think in India, we have a broader, uh, uh, you know, problem around uh, uh, female labor force participation. Uh, it has, you know, precipitously declined over the last couple of decades and is at, you know, an all time low. So um, unfortunately, that is the, the situation. I think as we move beyond the digital, and I had clarified why we are initially focused on digital. Uh, but when we move, you know, as our AI models, uh, you know, sort of mature and we're able to move to other segments that are less digital, uh, we, you know, we, 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 we will certainly like whether it's factory workers or, uh, you know, uh, construction labor or, or domestic workers. I mean, these are massive pools that have, you know, and, and many of them, you know, there's, there's a lot more representation by women. So, so. Uh, from a product standpoint, whether we will, you know, think of, you know, sensitivity towards uh, a gender lens, of course, we will have to, but I mean, there's no point in me talking about that at this point, because we haven't thought that through that far. Um, in terms of the common uses for credit lines, uh, you know, I think what we are seeing, uh, I mean, the broad headline there is that it's needs based. It's, it's not, it, it's, it's fairly non-discretionary, which is good news from a sustainability of credit standpoint. Um, you know, we also see patterns where, uh, you know, it is, it is, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, depending again, what the use, if it's, if it's working capital, then it's more continuous and it's linked to working cycles. But if it's, if it's personal, then it's, it's, it tends to be clustered towards the end of the month, um, uh, which is also interesting and it helps us plan in, in various ways, which I won't get into. Uh, but, um, but, but I think it's mostly around uh, you know, fuel, uh, you know, medical expenses, if small emergencies like a mobile or, a, you know, uh, a vehicle repair, uh, groceries, uh, paying back loans to other people, so on and so forth. Yeah, those are the major, the major use cases that we have seen. Great. Um, Shakib, do you also want to answer the question on the gender lens? Yes. So, um, at Safe Border, uh, Border Border is also um, you know, mostly a male-driven uh, uh, industry, uh, but we are proud to have at least two female safe body riders uh, out of our 15,000. Uh, but uh, just the way we have approached this is uh, 
we're looking at a safe border as a, an entity that exists within an ecosystem, and the ecosystem that we're looking at is a family. So what we look, what we are trying to do is to find solutions that empower the family as a whole, and to able to, uh, to bring in uh, wives and, and and partners as uh, you know financial to, to, to as financial contributors. How we do this is when we're providing the financial literacy training, we encourage uh, safe borders to come with their wives, and they do that. And after that, we hope to work uh, specific. We hope to work with them as a unit, as a husband and wife, to get a loan to have to uh, get a, an, a, an alternative um, income source uh, to diversify the, the, their income as as as, as a unit. So uh, we're working with uh, our fin and other financial service providers to help us uh, provide small scale loans. Uh, for uh, safe border wives and safe border families, uh, families, and also when we're uh, alleviating problems like school uh, school fees, uh, one of we ha we're working with a particular school that is offering scholar scholarships to safe borders that have the girl that have girls. Um, so for for secondary education, so we try to uh, look for partnerships that are able to, that enable um, that look at financial inclusion as as an important factor, uh, and also uh, our partnership with UNFPA. Uh, is focusing on gender-based violence, um, gender-based violence alleviation uh, looks to sort of bring the bring the task back to the border border the safe border or uh, the border border driver to sort of be the active change the active change agent in their communities around issues to do uh, with gender. Um, thank you so much, Shakib. Um, Rishi, there are uh, two questions for you. One is. Have you seen a model work for digital platforms that also deploy agency, as well as what are the implications of the open credit enablement network by the India stack for the gig economy? Uh, so I think actually, uh, since I'm not a lender, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with the uh, OSIN uh, regulations, but I think Badal might be better placed to answer that question. Uh, so I, I I would hand, hand it off to him. Badal, will you take that one? Sure. Uh, just would you I'll come back to the first one? Uh, I'll just read it out for you. Uh, actually, do you I, I can I can read it out for you. No problem. Uh, mm -hmm. The question was, what are the implications of the open credit enablement network by India Stack for Indian fintech catering to gig workers? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I think uh, uh, you know it it, it 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 opens up the the playing field and it enables one more source of public data. You know, I mean, it, it enables one more source of data. Um, uh, I mean, that's how we see it. Um, but I think uh, you know, I mean, a there will be a few years before it. It, it becomes, um, you know, it becomes kind of uh, really actionable. And, uh, and second, I think for gig workers, see, again, it depends on, you know, you have to get pretty granular in terms of what kind of data really, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, helps, uh, uh, you know, helps understand, assess, uh, influence, right? Uh, and, and, and that's where, I mean, we, we believe that you know, a work data that comes from platforms, right, is one, uh, you know, very interesting data asset. Another is just, you know, sort of, uh, you know, mobile log data, right, behavioral data uh, that, that, you know, just, in, just, just kind of is generated from the mobile by virtue of using it, because that also has quite a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it can predict behavior in very interesting ways. Uh, and then third, you know, actual payments data, transaction data. So, uh, so I think, uh, I mean, just in terms of where that kind of data would stack up, it would be, it would add some, you know, it would add a layer of insight, but it would be, I think, in my mind, it would be marginal, uh, in particular, uh, you know, to the con context of the gig worker and their lives. Thank you. Rishi, do you want to answer the question on agency? Yes. Um, so, I mean, the honest answer is no. <laughs> I, there are not that many good examples. Uh, but that being said, digital platforms are fairly young. Impact investing in digital platforms is even younger. Uh, so, I'm still hopeful. Uh, I, I would say this, though. I think 
uh, the gig working gig worker economy is a particularly interesting space because it's at the intersection of the organized sector and informal labor so generally uh, you know there's formality and organization are not necessarily interconnected so the organized economy is uh, you know your corporates your banks whoever they often uh, you know contract and subcontract to the informal economy um, right so informality has to do with the status of your employment whether you're part of the organized or the unorganized economy has to do with who the final client is who is conducting the business so the gig economy is really a rare example of uh, the organized economy so like uber is organized right zomato is organized hiring a bunch of people semi formally or if not form, uh, you know formally so i think it really if you can create a successful product for the gig economy then it really has the capability to uh, sort of spill over to other agencies whether in terms of the products offered services offered or in terms of uh, the target groups that you move to uh, Yeah, I, I I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's what I have now. Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess when looking at the time, we've gone overboard, but this has been really really interesting to just understand what's happening in the ecosystem. Uh, from kind of key insights I'm hearing is there's still a lot of information gap within the area. Um, some of the even the restaurant and the people in the panel are asking question like what are some of the areas one can look for information or data on what's happening in gig economy in both of the countries um other challenges you're seeing also definitely there's a gap in the financial services and as gig economy players with the gig economy we're trying to bring up new solutions to support that and similarly that partnership is really key but always understanding what are the needs of the um the workers and making sure that you actually get the most biggest need now and then continue the journey from social to social mobility as well so i guess yeah this has been really really useful then there was a question of where some where, where you can look for information um yeah i think it was actually answered masiko did a research for kenya last year and um they did a really great report in understanding gig economy <laughs> in kenya so that can be something interesting but also we've seen flourish um also have done a bit of research in africa in in kind of understanding also more the gig economy so i guess as we finish up the panel and the discussion we have one last question um i think um uh, which will say popping up in terms of give us feedback on how the panel has been and also how the discussion and the dialogue has been where i i guess one is the best and or sorry one is the worst the least helpful and five is the most helpful Great. Um, I guess we'll finish up. Yeah. So Rasima, back to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for fielding the questions and for summarizing the panel. And thank you, panel members, um, all of you for your time and your insights. Um, I think this particular hour plus 12 minutes was uh, especially interesting and insightful for us to understand how the two markets are, just like Michelle summarized. So uh, to the audience, thank you so much for your time. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us uh, and, and we can always facilitate or, or help answer them as well. And uh, if you are interested in any of the reports or have any further questions for the panelists, uh, again, please feel free to reach out and we'll, we'll certainly send and share things your way as well. Mm -hmm.